Broadcasting from Silicon Valley, California, this is Conversations with Jenny Lynn. You're watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn, and today my guest is a South African doctor, David Golshag. And unfortunately, we're having problems with this camera, so we won't <laughs> be able to see much of him. Hopefully this yeah, Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, David, thank you so much. I know you're a busy doctor, and I'm grateful that you could spare this time with me this morning for this interview. Welcome to Conversations. Definitely. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me all the way from the United States. Absolutely. When I chose to do this series, my goal was to cover as many countries as I possibly could. And Zoom, when it's cooperating, it makes that very easy. I don't know yeah. if it's a Zoom problem. I don't know why we can't see you, but let's just continue. So you are a pediatrician in South Africa. You're in Cape Town. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So I'm an intern. I'm currently doing pediatrics at Tigerberg Hospital in Cape Town. Okay. And is COVID-19 affecting your hospital at all? Yeah, definitely. We've seen a lot of COVID-19. We have um, we the biggest hospital in the Western Cape, which is my province. And then we actually the second biggest, as far as I believe, we're the second biggest hospital in South Africa. So we see a lot of sick patients as a tertiary hospital. Um, it's not usually walk-in patients that we get. We usually deal with referrals. So a lot of those patients who are sick, especially those who are sick with COVID-19, do come to us eventually but did you see children with it or is the hospital open to people besides babies so the hospital is open for everybody it's just one okay. department that is the um the pediatric side of it okay have you seen any children with the disease yes so we do we have had cases at tigerberg hospital of children who have covid and we have been um treating them Oh my goodness, I didn't realize that. So do you know to date how many contaminations in that your hospital has recorded? No, we, I don't know the exact number. We don't have the exact figures, but we, we have had a few cases, not that many though. Okay, so were, are you a native of South Africa? Yes, I was actually born in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, and then I moved to Cape Town for work. And what was that like growing up in South Africa, in Johannesburg? Oh, lovely, a very, very, very nice um, city. It's a bit of a concrete jungle. There's not really that much in Johannesburg itself in terms of maybe the sea or a mountain or something like that. It's a, it's a landlocked city. There's no big river that runs through it. It's actually, I believe it's the only city in the world that doesn't, that is not um, built on a river, the only major city in the world. So we don't have anything like that in terms of nature. It's a nice way to escape the city, but there is a lot around the city that you can go to, a lot of game parks and a lot of places to go and hike, um, dams that you can go and have recreation and at. It's a really nice <clears throat> area to be in. One day, one day, it's on my bucket. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, I hope so. And Cape Town as well. Yes, so how do you compare the two cities? I, would def I definitely prefer Cape Town. The only reason really is because of the, the nature that surrounds you. So it's very easy to go from your flat. Just yesterday, we were allowed to get out for exercising in South Africa. We have a curfew from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So usually you get home from work at about, well, close to six and you can quickly pop out and actually get to a mountain. Um, or maybe you can go to the sea and you can walk on the promenade, which is really nice just to be in a nice headspace where you can just de-stress from the whole day and focus on something that's bigger than yourself and your job and what you're going through. That's awesome. Why did you choose to become a pediatrician? Of all the so, difficulties, I had to ask you that. Yeah, so, so at the moment I'm interning. So <clears throat> pediatrics is one of the things that, that I have to go through, that I have to do. Uh, so it's not so much a choice, 
But I will say that I, I really do enjoy it. And it is something that I could perhaps see myself committing to in the future. But at the moment, we, we rotate through uh, all of the different specialities or a large number of the different specialities in order to give you exposure to everything. Okay. And you are going to school in South Africa, I take it. No, no. So I've already finished. Um, in South Africa, the way it works is you do, you do the school for six years and then you become a doctor and then you start working. So I've already finished that. Um, I did that in Pretoria. I actually did my medical degree in Pretoria, the MD. Okay. Well, the world needs more doctors, especially at this time. Yeah, and especially South Africa. Now that you're dealing with this pandemic, I know sometimes we make choices for our careers and I always ask this question because a few times in my life I thought I wanted to do what I started and discovered it's not what I really enjoy. Are you happy that you've chosen medicine? That's a, a very loaded question. I think that um, it, it's, it definitely applies to me. I actually started after I finished my school, which I suppose you'll call middle school when I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, so you're 17, 18 years old, finished grade 12. I actually started doing a BCom at Witt University in Johannesburg. And the reason for that was I always wanted to do medicine and it is in my family. I have my grandparents and I have aunts and uncles who are doctors and it's, it's quite prevalent. In, we're quite prevalent in the medical world in terms of having doctors there. Um, and <clears throat> I went and did a bit of community service at, at the hospital and I thought that just the amount of help that you could provide somebody with was so limited to just your own hands as a doctor because yeah. you can only help people, as many people in one day, as many people as you can physically lay your hands on. That's what medicine is about really, examining patients and treating them with your hands. And um, I thought that that was too little, that, that, that I wouldn't be able to do enough. So I started doing a BCom um, to study commerce and economics. It was majoring in economics and politics. And the reason for that was that I thought I could perhaps do more with that than just the medical degree and physically touching patients. Um, so I did that for almost two years until I realized that actually my calling is medicine. And this is where I, I should be there. I should become a doctor and a And that's why I changed track and landed up eventually committing to medicine and you are clearly enjoying it yes yeah i definitely enjoyed it it definitely has its tough times no no doctor will tell you that it's easy and no doctor will tell you that it's fun all the time there are parts of of being a doctor and being in the medical world in general i think that are are really quite they're quite horrible i'll say even you 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 see a lot, you see a lot of trauma, you see a lot of things that perhaps people shouldn't see, be seeing you, and you see people die and you have to deal with death on an almost daily basis, depending on where you work. And then another part of it is the calls, the overtime that we work, the calls that you do where you're at the hospital for 24, 30, 36 hours are, are very taxing, both on you as a person and on your relationships around you. And uh, it does get very difficult at times, but that's not all that it is. It's not, it's not always that. That's just a small part of it. Well, I thank you. And I understand that because I too, you know, for a large, for a long period of my life was working in the medical system. Um, yeah. Do you feel like your hospital was prepared for COVID-19? So our hospital in Tigerberg was probably one of the best prepared hospitals, I, I might argue, in South Africa, uh, sp certainly in the Western Cape, because we were the designated COVID hospital when, um, when the cases started to trickle in. Uh, we even started to clear out some wards that we committed to, to being COVID wards. Um, we did a tent outside the actual building, outside the hospital, that can be converted into a field hospital if the need would arise. It hasn't arisen yet. So, so at the moment, we're using that tent for screening and swabbing new patients, new cases. But I would say that in terms of things like the personal protective equipment, the PPE, we were very well stocked, at least on the doctors and nurses side. <clears throat> I can't speak for the 
allied health professions, for example, radiography or OT or physiotherapy. But from our side, we were really well prepared. Well, congratulations. And that's very important, especially for protecting you staff as well, you doctors and nurses and the people treating these patients. Yeah, yeah. So having said that, actually, we, we have quite a few cases, positive cases at Tigerberg Hospital in the staff. Um, it's oh. been on the news lately. We had at one stage, I think, 107 cases in our hospital staff. And now it's gone up to close. So a lot of, a lot of people are still getting the disease, um, which, is, which is difficult for us to deal with, obviously, going to work every day. But the number of active cases is dwindling as people make their full recoveries and come back to work. So for the majority of people, they have made recoveries and are back at work, which is great. But we are obviously still aware that this is a, a really, it's a real threat. It's not something that's to be joked about or turned your nose up at. Um, and you have to use your PPE correctly. If you're, not, if you're not using the PPE correctly, like we've been advised to, and like we have the protocols that are set in place, then you are definitely at risk of getting the disease yourself. But you haven't lost any um, counterparts to the disease, people that you work with. We, we have lost a few sisters, uh, nurses, and, and um, I believe a porter as well. Oh no, I am so sorry. I'm really sorry. Yeah. You it's know, devastating. It definitely takes a toll on the community and just on the overall morale of the hospital, which is really a sobering when these people unfortunately passed away. It was really sobering for the hospital because it's the first time that we've um, been exposed to that, I think. You know, I was wondering why some people recover and some people die. I, I understand that older people are at risk of dying because their, you know, their immune system probably is already compromised because of other illnesses. But when young people, some young people die and some don't, I am confused as to why that could be. Could you speak to yeah. that? Yes, yeah, so th that it is a very confusing thing and I'm glad that you bring it up because I, I think that the answer to that at the moment is we don't know. We don't know why and some people are not fine. And um, the scary thing is that almost there's nothing that will keep you safe from COVID. So sure, if you are young, fit and healthy, then the chances of you having a poor outcome if you were to contract the disease, then it's very, very low, but it can still happen. Um, I think that, that that's what makes COVID so scary is the fact that you don't know. So I know that I don't have any comorbid conditions and I'm young, fit and healthy, but I still don't know what could happen to me if I did contract the disease. I could very well um, have a poor outcome. So <clears throat> I think that a lot of research is going into it at the moment and we, we're going to see a lot, a lot of research that will go into this in the years to come to see exactly why some people responded so poorly to the disease. You know, I'm so grateful for this opportunity, although I can't see you, because there's still people out there saying this is an exaggeration. We've had SARS. We've had so many diseases. It's not, you know, it's, it's a conspiracy. There's still people. And two people that I have spoken with recently are physicians. And they're telling me... Yeah. This is overrated in a conspiracy. What do you want to say to them, David? Look, I don't, in South Africa, we're not, we're, not con, we're not big into conspiracies. I know that in America, <laughs> there's a lot of conspiracy theorists and people really enjoy to look deeper into things. Um, I, I will say that there's been so many epidemiologists and people who speak about how more infectious the SARS-CoV-2 is than yeah. the initial SARS that a lot of people saw. And it does definitely seem like that. It, this disease seems like it spreads like wildfire. If you're in a room with people of COVID, then the majority of the people in the room are going to get it as well. So it just seems like it's more infectious. Uh, I can't speak too much about that because I'm, I'm myself, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I don't know the stats well enough to be able to say, look, this is far more infectious. But from a clinical point of view, where I'm dealing with these patients every day along with my colleagues, 
it definitely seems like it is more infectious. Uh, so far as it being a, a conspiracy that it's, that it's more, that people are blowing, blowing it out of proportion, we, we in South Africa have been very lucky because we haven't been hit as hard as the United States have. Um, and we haven't had as many cases, but I think that we've also had a population of people who have, for the most part, followed the, the lockdown rules. So we had a hard lockdown for a month and then we had some restrictions lifted for a month. And now we've, at the beginning of June, we've entered into the next level of our, of our um, restriction, which is one level down, you know, so we're slowly coming out of it. But yeah, it's just, if I look at what's been happening in America, it seems like people have been taking it, have, haven't been taking it seriously at all. We've just been saying that it's not, it's, it's not, it's not that big a deal. We'll be fine. And it's a very dangerous way to approach something because every day we see people who die. Every day we have new cases in the hospital. Every day we're putting people on different um, breathing respiratory support, supports. And I think that being at the front, at the forefront of it, it really, like I said previously, it brings it home to you that this is a very real thing. It's not, it's not something that, that is a joke. Which is why I'm grateful to you that you, you, although you're so busy, were able to fit me in because they, they need to hear from people like you who are coming face to face with the reality of this, putting your own life at risk every day. Because I get, I'm very bothered when I have these conversations with them and I have to restrain myself so it doesn't become an argument because... Yeah. Because I do this every day. I speak to people around the world about this disease and what it's doing in their countries. And I must yeah. tell you, the common thread is, like you say, people who are being compliant, who are following the, the rules and the, um, the guidelines, <clears throat> they have less of them dying. And I think, in yeah. a, for example, in the U.S., and Brazil and, and uh, Italy and the countries where they've had such a widespread and so many fatalities and so many contaminations, they're the ones that are saying, oh, this is overrated, it's blown out of proportion. So yeah. clearly it is not, it is a threat and it can take a lot of lives if we don't follow the protocols that are being set by the experts. Um, Certainly, yes. You must be very frustrated when you will look at what's happening in the United States. We are supposed to be a superpower. We should have had this thing under control. What do you think about Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that. I mean, people might think you, uh, this doctor in South Africa, they don't even know where that is. But really, uh, it's, I think it's a... It's an objective thing. It's not a subjective thing of what's happening. If just if you purely look at the numbers, then you need to realize that there's a problem and that the, that, that the people are not on top of it. And I think it's like you say that they're not following the protocols and not following the rules. They're not doing what they're supposed to do because they think that uh, Big Brother is, is forcing this down their throats. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe Big Brother needs to force it down your throats a little bit. And, and that's actually a good thing, I would perhaps argue. Uh, but I know that a lot of people won't like to hear that. And I think the sad thing is those people with the, with those attitudes are asymptomatic. And so they're yeah, exactly. contaminating everybody they come in contact with. And if it's a person with a compromised immune system, they could cost that person their life. And that's what bothers me about this most of all. Yeah, me too. So I, I was actually interviewed on a local news show uh, last week where they asked me a very similar question and those those are the people that are the most dangerous the people who are going to be asymptomatic the people who are going to be have mild course of disease and we we i almost worry about those more than somebody who's sick in hospital because those are the people who are going around and spreading it and then next thing you know you've got a three-week-old baby who's in the hospital who has COVID and shouldn't be having this disease um shouldn't be getting something like that and having to fight through it at such a young age so really what's what's what is best here for the greater good that you can't go outside and um sorry i just saw somebody who 
has just collapsed now on the side of the oh, of building. Do you want to go take um, them? Can, can I pause it for a second? David, welcome back. You see? Thank you. You're such a great doctor. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we got to try here. You saw someone in need and you just kicked out the American journalist and you took off to help your patient, <laughs> as you should. <laughs> Sorry, I had to jump in there quickly just to see if I could help, but it was okay, yeah. Yeah. No, you did the right thing. I was just kidding. So... You know, yeah. you were, uh, we were talking about this COVID-19. Um, One of the questions that was popping into my head that I really wanted to ask you was, you mentioned that in South Africa right now, you are going into a different level of lockdown. And last Saturday, I interviewed someone else um, that you know, um, and, and I'm grateful to her for this introduction. That's how come we're doing this? She mentioned it's where they would be opening up so more people could get out. How do you feel about that at this particular time? <clears throat> yeah, so that was uh, Rafaela, uh, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, so it's an interesting time. We have in South Africa, we have a uh, five level or five stage lockdown. Um, level five being the hardest lockdown where basically everything is shut down. Um, and then we were at level four for a while and now we've gone into level three, like I said, at the beginning of June. Um, it's difficult. It's a tough time. It's a tough, it's tough to gauge rather why, what, why we need what we need and when we need it. So it's, it's hard to be proactive. This is a very reactive thing. So the only reason that we had the lockdown was to prepare the hospitals for the masses that are coming, which they've now deemed has been done. Um, and in other words, it's, it's, I think it's, in other words, saying, okay, now we can let people start to get the disease. If they're going to get it, then at least we'll be prepared for it. And I think that we have prepared um, quite well for it. I would, I'm not saying that we'll, we will definitely be able to handle everything that comes our way. But I think that the, the time that the lockdown allowed for has really allowed us to batten down the hatches and just get ready for what's coming our way. Uh, so that's the thinking behind it. You want people yeah. to have immunity to it now, rather than preventing it completely. Yes, exactly. So the, the whole idea of lockdown for, for us at least, and I think it's a general epidemiological principle, is that a lockdown is not to, um, is not to stop the spread of a disease, it's to slow it down. Mm -hmm. Like people say, flatten the curve. Yeah. And the whole point of slowing it down is that it will continue for longer, Everybody can see that on the curve. It's it's um, it's like a one plus one equals two graphic. Uh, it will continue for longer, but the level, the spikes that we have won't be as prevalent. Meaning that the hospital system can handle those people like it usually handles people. Okay. Now, yeah. one of the the rules that your government, um, one of the um, rules that they put in place uh, was no smoking and no alcohol as a physician. Yeah. As a doctor, what do you have to say about that whole notion? Because I, I was, um, I was wondering the thinking behind it. I, I agree with the no smoking. I understand how that works. And then the so this is for a short, well, not for a short time. It was for quite a long while that we weren't allowed to buy alcohol or cigarettes or anything that had to do with smoking. And I understand the reasoning behind it, and that was that, the, especially in South Africa in the poorer communities, people don't smoke um, cigarettes as much as rolled cigarettes. Right. I think that's, that's quite a common thing. Actually, I, I wouldn't know, I'm not, I'm not a smoker, but I think that people share cigarettes a lot, definitely in poorer communities, and people also ro roll their own. And our, our minister is famous as having said, when people zoll, they put saliva on the paper. And a Zoll is a cigarette. So if you roll your own with your own tobacco and you're smoking that, then you've got your own spit that's on the actual paper. And then you give that to your friend and then that person inhales that. So that does make sense that, that you can, um, uh -huh. you can, no, can maybe prevent some of the community spread through that. Yeah, and the see, alcohol, sorry, yeah? I said, now I see the thinking behind the cigarettes, but I listened to yes. the explanation for the alcohol. Yeah, so the alcohol was... That, that I don't think has anything to do with uh, or has much to do with transmitting COVID itself. That, has to, that had more to do 
with what is going on in the hospitals because South Africa has a very, very high burden of trauma from alcohol and from the violence that accompanies it. We always see, we, we see spikes in, at the end of the month when it's payday, then that Friday night, that Saturday night, we get an influx of cases of trauma. Everything you can imagine, stabs and shootings, pedestrian accidents, motor vehicle accidents. And we have a lot of patients that we have to deal with. So I think eliminating the alcohol eliminated a lot of that burden that we had to carry in the hospital. So we could focus our resources and attention elsewhere. You know, I grew up in a culture where, as you speak, my childhood is coming back. You constantly heard women complaining their husbands collected the paychecks, wound up in the rum shops, came home, paycheck spent, drunk. Yeah, and the family yeah exactly. <laughs> Sounds like a similar culture there. Definitely, yeah. It, it is a very similar, I think it's, it's a shocking reality for a lot of South Africans. And we know that um, in South Africa, the alcohol sales does spike at that time. So I think it's safe to say that, um, that we do see that sort of trend, yeah. I must tell you how impressed I am with your government and your country. I really, yeah. I really admire that because, you know, we hear over time, over the years, these countries suffer the most when you have something like this pandemic. And the fact that you're doing better than the United States and, you know, countries more developed than yours, it says a lot for the way you've handled this. So yes, definitely. Yeah. Congratulations. I mean, it's been so impressive, and I think it's almost all due to our who we have steering the ship and our politicians and our president yes. because they've they've really they jumped on it when it was when we were in the infancy of the whole pandemic in in South Africa when it started hitting our shores and had a hard lockdown, hard rules. We decided that <clears throat> this is the way forward and we are going to prepare for this and make sure that it doesn't overwhelm our system because we all know it's already overburdened. I think that maybe in America there was a bit of complacency where they underestimated what was coming because precisely like you say, you know, we're America, we're developed, yeah. And everybody thinks, okay, we can handle this. But actually, it, it really burdened their health system as well. And it doesn't help if you have someone at the at the steering wheel who himself is maybe a conspiracy theorist or somebody who doesn't take into account hard data yes you know and so unfortunately when you have a captain and you're on a ship you are at yes. the mercy of his decisions exactly and you go down with that ship with that and captain exactly. yeah exactly you are you are powerless even though you can see this captain taking you into an iceberg there's nothing yeah. you could do if he is wrong and determined to go in that direction because he's exactly and so what is happening in this country is a reflection of some of the decisions that we were not privy to make but we just yeah. have to follow so yeah. hopefully it will start cleaning up here now but i don't see it because i'm sure you are aware of some of the demonstrations that are currently happening here because of racism. And if yeah, I think watching them, it's like they forgot about the coronavirus. Yes, I've actually also noticed that myself. I mean, I've seen a lot about George Floyd, uh, George Floyd, sorry. And, um, <clears throat> and we see a lot of the news that's going on at the moment and a lot of the demonstrations yeah. and a lot of the things that I see, I've noticed the exact same thing. You know, it's the people who are going out protesting a lot of people are going to be wearing masks and um, paying attention to social distancing rules because you can't really if you're in a protest. I myself have been involved in lots of protests in South Africa. We had protests with, for, with our government and also against gender-based violence. And when you're in that mindset and when you're doing those things as, as a group of people, you can't really follow the rules of social distancing, for example. So I think you're going to see a spike in the weeks to come in the areas where there have been a lot of people who have been congregating together. I agree with you and that's been bothering me, but what can I do? I can just sit here and, and talk to people and... And, and obviously that. it's also important for people to express what they are feeling. And I, I really am behind the, the, the protests that are going on. Obviously the looting and everything is another story. Nobody, is, nobody backs that. Um, but the, the problem that is obviously existent in America 
is a glaring one and it's something that needs to be addressed. So I'm happy that people are protesting. I just wish it was maybe at a different time and we went in the middle of a global pandemic. Exactly. Now, David, you live in a country that suffered similar type racism. What are yeah. your views on, on the whole black and white issue? What, what do you mean a uh, black and what I mean, do you mean issue? You know, where they, the, in, the, in the world, there's been um, some, there are people who believe if your skin is dark, you're inferior. And they oh, okay. fit pretty poorly. And yeah. uh, I am half black. Yeah. And it's not, uh, it's not visible. And so I know what it's like for black people because people have come to <clears> me. <throat> and said a lot of very derogatory things about black people because they don't know I'm half black. So I know that yeah. problem exists and I know it exists in your country. Do you think it's as bad there as it, uh, it seems like it is in the US? So if you, you, your initial question is to say what I think about the um, black white issue. Yeah. I'm obviously vehemently against racism. I wasn't in South Africa. It is, Actually, in any place in the world, it, there's no place for it. There's absolutely no place for it. And I, 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 don't, I don't know. I think of somebody who, who hates racism and who hates racists. And it's difficult because, like you say, in, in our society, if, you, if you're white, then a lot of people view you as a racist immediately off the bat. And um, people will come to you and, and they will say things, like you said. People will say overtly racist things to you thinking that you are complacent in, in, or you think the same as they do, and you have to call them out. And it's becoming more and more, um, people are becoming more, more and more aware of the fact that you, it starts at home and you have to call it out with your people, with your friends, your family, your colleagues, whoever it is, anybody who's approaching you with, with that in their, in their hearts and the racism in their hearts, you need to call that out and you need to address it directly with them because otherwise they do think it's fine. And if you don't say anything, then you are complacent in it. Agreed, 100%. I don't know if I will ever see a change in my lifetime. I think some people are just wired that way and they don't look at the facts. They're just looking at the color. And so it's just probably something that while I am still on this planet, may continue to be a problem, but hopefully we will have more people changing their attitudes and just seeing people as people, whether they're yellow, yeah. young, black, or blue. And I know as a doctor, you clearly love people because you have to treat all people. Well, I, I always laugh about this because in, well, there's something that I laugh about, not, not about that, sorry. What I laugh about is in, I studied in Pretoria and Pretoria was part of the racist apartheid South Africa. And in the, the medical school that they had there, we have samples that the medical students now look at, even, even in the 2000s, because they are so obviously it's easy to preserve these parts and these pathologies. And most of the examples that they have of human anatomy are from black people which is really interesting because <clears throat> it was white people who were studying medicine at the time and they were studying the, the black people's specimens, the anatomy of the body through black people. Meanwhile, the government at the time was telling us how different black people are from white people. Yet at the same time, these same white people were busy studying black people to understand how bodies work, which is really funny for me because it's, it's, it's ironic. It's so <laughs> ironic. <laughs> In, yeah, in fact, the, the irony is, is so poignant because it just shows you that there is no difference. And yeah, I think it's just funny how, how that was what they were doing at the time. They were being so contradictory, not realizing how stupid you are. Exactly. And it, you don't even need, I mean, it's so blatant. But I think at the end of the day, some people just have to, they have anger. And I think a lot yeah. of it is misdirected and that's so easy to pick the color thing or someone that yeah. you, you inferior to yourself. And so we just have to keep on being the best we can be and being examples. And I think if everyone takes that stance, at least the, it, the, the haters will be outnumbered. Yeah, agreed, definitely. And that will make a huge change. So, um, we're running out of time and I don't want to take up more of your time, although I'm enjoying this interview <laughs> tremendously. Yeah, it's been great. 
I would like to do another segment where we can actually have you on the camera because people don't want to just keep looking at me. And so <laughs> before but you can start, handle the, you can handle that pressure. You know, you have, you're a famous journalist there. So <laughs> at least you can handle it. Uh, me, not so much. <laughs> if I was on my own. Trust me, I'm not famous. I don't want to be famous. And if I am famous, I want it to be for creating change for the better in the world. That's the favor nice. you want. Yeah, now, for sure. Before we wrap up, what would you like, what message would you like to leave with my viewers? Well, I think that because your, your viewership is um, United States and, and Americans, my message would be take this seriously. Let's not play games. Let's do what we're supposed to do. Let's focus on what people are telling us. Drop the conspiracy theories. This is a real disease. It's a virus that you can actually see and you can look at with your own eyes. And you can also see the people in the hospital who are deteriorating and dying from it. So if you need to, if you're not able to go outside when you want to go outside or to walk your dog or to, I don't know, do what, ride your bicycle for a month or two, then sucks to be you. Sorry about that, but that's what you got to do. Just stick it through. It's for the best. Thank you so much, David. And what have you learned about David during this crisis? Sure. It's, I think I've, what I've learned is that I'm very interested in this. I could actually see myself getting into to the sort of public health, this population health, and um, I think it's sort of ignited an interest for, of that in me. And perhaps in the future, I could see myself being on these global teams or these decision-making bodies like the WHO, for example, and helping to effect change for a, a large number of people. You are an admirable person. And if I were living in South Africa, I would want you to be my daughter, although I'm not a baby. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll I, definitely be your doctor. It's okay. <laughs> thank you. I am so grateful to you for taking this time. Every sure. person who encounters you is a lucky person. I wish sure, you a you. career, and I know you're going to be an outstanding doctor. You already are. And I look forward to hopefully connecting with you in the future to do a, another segment, hopefully, about something more positive. Yeah, and with video. And we're ready. <laughs> yeah. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for having me on your show. Oh, and thank you for taking time during this crazy time to accommodate my show. And I thank sure. you so much for watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn. When a conversation is all you need to be inspired, like Dr. Goldshack has just educated and inspired us. Thank you so much, doctor. Take care of yourself. Stay safe and I will be in touch.